Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at a channel called Real Truth Real Quick. You may remember them from a little over a year ago when they were talking about how to discuss LGBTQ issues with your kids. And that was every bit as cringeworthy as you are probably imagining. Now I'm looking at their video about the age of the Earth, so I'm sure they'll be just as thoughtful when it comes to science as they were with social issues. In other words, I do not have high hopes for this one at all. So let's go! Welcome to Real Truth Real Quick. My name is Adam Tarno, joined as always by Todd Wagner. Hello Adam, hello friends. All right, Todd, question today is this, how old is the Earth? It's about 4.54 billion years old, give or take 50 million years. This is important because sometimes people say, man, you're old as dirt. Yes. And you wonder how old you are. Well, the dirt on the surface of the Earth is most certainly much younger than the Earth itself, although it is possible for the dirt to contain minerals that are roughly the same age as the Earth. But the substance we refer to as dirt is a constantly generated substance, so it is much younger. Most of the dirt on the surface of the Earth was formed about two million years ago, when the Earth went through an ice age that resulted in much cooler and drier environments, where deserts expanded and dust storms sent dirt all around the globe, while the advancing of glaciers ground existing soil in with plants and rocks to form new dirt as they progressed. Now of course new dirt is still forming as rainwater interacts with bedrock, but most of our dirt is about two million years old. Right? Yes. Uh, I've never been invited to the Earth's birthday party, so I don't really know. But it is an important question. Yeah, it certainly is. That much we can agree on. Okay. Okay. So uh, the age of the Earth, it quickly devolves into a conversation about what's your understanding of the creation process. How about we cut out the loaded language, though? Like, why can't you say your understanding of how the Earth formed? It's not that hard, and it doesn't exclude God. It's not really a big deal, it's just annoying that I always go out of my way to use language that doesn't definitionally exclude your conclusion, instead I rely on the evidence to do that, while you go out of your way to word things in a loaded fashion to make any non-God proposition sound goofy right out of the gate. And a lot of the reasons that people want to know if we as believers can embrace an older Earth is because they don't want to look stupid amongst their friends that have a bias towards um, maybe some of the hard sciences. A bias toward hard science. Preferring natural explanations that are supported by hard evidence is a bias now. Great. Or just towards scientism in general. Oh, more loaded language, yay. It is so great that you're starting strong, bringing evidence to support your position, instead of wording things in a way that encourages a biased view in your viewers. And we have been intimidated for a long time, we believers, have been intimidated for a long time by a Darwinistic worldview which is that natural processes can pretty much explain everything that is here. Wow. Just... Wow. I think the term you're actually looking for here is methodological naturalism, not Darwinistic. Darwinism, in as far as it means anything, is referring simply to the theory of evolution. This does have some potential worldview implications, but it is not itself a worldview. The worldview of methodological naturalism, though, is essentially the agreement that when studying nature, only natural explanations will be presented for the simple and pragmatic reason that we have no mechanism at this time that is even capable of investigating the supernatural. It's something that all scientists, even religious ones, adhere to when they are doing their scientific work, regardless of what philosophical positions they might hold to outside of the lab. And then of course there is philosophical naturalism, which is the position that there is nothing outside of the natural world. Scientists do not have to be philosophical naturalists, and indeed many of them are not, so it is ultimately irrelevant to this discussion. Which by the way, that is only 150 some odd years old. Right. The theory of evolution by natural selection itself is about 150 years old, yes, but you are equating it with methodological naturalism, which has been in practice since at least the 16th century. Not that it matters, how old a philosophical viewpoint is, is entirely irrelevant to the merits of that position. This seems almost like a reversal of the atheist trope. You know, that whole, why would I look to a book that was written thousands of years ago for X? So here you are reversing it and saying, well, this position is relatively young, we should go with the tried and true position. 
both of these positions have issues. So how about instead of looking at the age of an idea, we instead evaluate it based on its merits. New ideas can be wrong, and old ideas can be right, but the age of an idea is not a factor that determines which ones are right and which ones are wrong. Okay. okay. I mean, we have to remind ourselves that Darwinistic theory is a theory. What the fuck do you even mean? The theory of evolution is a theory, yes. And when speaking scientifically, that essentially means that it has got enough evidence backing it up that it is not possible for the whole thing to be wrong at this point. Now certainly part of any theory are hypotheses whose accuracy is still in question, but that's the whole point of science, to investigate the parts that we don't understand, thereby increasing the size of the parts that we do understand. Cell theory is a theory. Gravity is a theory. The germ theory of disease is a theory. Theories are large bodies of knowledge that explain a collection of facts, data, and hypotheses. Just because we tend to use the word theory colloquially as meaning essentially the same thing as hypothesis in science, that does not mean you get to claim that evolution is uncertain because it's just a theory. And a lot of times it's taught as Darwinistic fact. The theory of evolution contains facts, yes. And one of those facts is that allele frequencies vary in populations over successive generations. This is the fact of evolution that is contained within the theory of evolution. One of the things that's going on that I think is really, really helpful is that um, we're having more and more conversations about the veracity of the different theories, and that we ought to look at the theory for intelligent design. Intelligent design is not a scientific theory. It is an hypothesis, and one that has no supporting evidence. Intelligent design as an hypothesis does not adequately explain any of the data contained within the theory of evolution, and relies entirely on attempting to poke holes in evolution rather than providing explanations of its own. And actually I'm getting too specific here, because intelligent design as a broad term doesn't preclude evolution. It just says that some intelligence designed the universe. You have people within the intelligent design community disagreeing on evolution, the Big Bang, and the age of the Earth. Intelligent design as an hypothesis relies on an argument from ignorance. We don't know how X could have happened naturally, therefore it must have been supernatural. There is never any mechanism presented, no test to verify or falsify the claim, just a statement of our lack of knowledge on a particular subject, followed by an assertion that it was the result of supernatural intervention. And the theory for natural design. Natural design, as far as I can tell, is the idea that there is a guiding force behind natural selection and evolution. It's hard to parse out, there is a lot of philosophical and new age gobbledygook cluttering up the Wikipedia page, and I don't think this is an important enough aspect of your argument for me to do some sort of deep dive on a subject that I'm not terribly interested in to begin with. But from what I can tell, if natural design does turn out to be true, it will be included in the theory of evolution rather than being a theory of its own. In other words, um, the more we can take a look at what the data suggests, happened, we'll take care of what I think is underneath the bigger argument, which is how old is the earth? Which is, are, are you a creationist or not? I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I got enough sleep last night to properly figure out what the hell he is even saying here. Okay, so regarding the text they have on screen, it looks like you're trying to say that an impartial examination of the data will lead to the position of either young earth creationism or not young earth creationism. And call me crazy, but I feel like you're leaning toward one answer over the other one before you even begin, at least judging by your gross mischaracterization of your opponent's position, that is. And if you're a creationist, um, how do you explain what certainly looks like dirt being very, very old? That's a good question. How do you explain it? So let me just have a, a few uh, goes at a couple of things. Number one, let me just say this. It sure looks like the earth is old because a lot of the processes that we look at out there that require um, the formation of fossil fuels or a diamond or, um, or erosion or the opposite of erosion, which is sedimentary buildup or the growing of stalactites or stalagmites, it looks like, wow, that must have taken a really long time. Yes, it certainly does appear that way. So the options here are one, the earth appears old because it is old, or two, God made the earth look way older than it actually is for reasons unknown. 
Though, to be fair, some of the things you mentioned aren't really indicative of the age of the Earth, like stalagmites and stalactites. They can form fairly quickly. It all depends on the composition of the rock that the water is dissolving, and the properties of the water that will either help or hinder the dissolving of the rock minerals, such as the pH level. So this actually looks like you are attempting to look reasonable while setting up a straw man of the scientific position that you can later knock down. Therefore, everything that looks like sediment's been built up or erosion has happened, it must be at least as old as how we can observe certain things happen today. No, it's more that we observe how things happen today, learn how things work, and use this knowledge to model how things would have been in the past. We don't just see that sedimentary layers form slowly and therefore declare that all sedimentary layers must form slowly, therefore the earth is old. No, we look at what type of sedimentary layer is forming. Volcanic layers can form much quicker than evaporite deposits, and we learn about the characteristics of these layers, and what sort of events would have had to have taken place in order to form them, and so we can directly determine what sort of environment existed when the layer that we are studying was formed. The problem with that is we, we even rule out when we do that the fact that there are some unnatural things in this natural earth that we live in. What do you mean by unnatural? Unnatural is typically used to refer to things that we don't find in nature. And if you want to be pedantic, human beings are a part of nature, therefore everything we do is technically natural. But generally, unnatural is used to refer to human actions. So are you going to try and suggest that humans made all of the layers in the stratigraphic column? Or are you just trying to avoid the use of the word supernatural so that you can pretend to be adhering to methodological naturalism when really you want something magical to be the solution to your problem? So volcanic eruption. Volcanic? eruptions. Volcanoes. Volcanoes are unnatural. Do you guys realize that we have pretty good naturalistic explanations for how volcanoes work? Like, are you suggesting that we need magic to explain volcanoes? Okay, is not an everyday event, but when it does, we see, wow, some of the things that we thought would take a long time Okay, okay, to happen, happen rapidly. Okay, was your use of the word unnatural a complete red herring? Were you just meaning not an everyday occurrence? But like, geologists have known for a long time that lava flows, pyroclastic flows, volcanic tufts, and the like can form rapidly. And yes, they do form layers. And no, nobody has ever suggested that all types of layers take a long time to form. And yes, geologists can tell what type of layer they are looking at. Fun fact, a lava flow will have different characteristics from a chalk bed. Um, floods, okay, okay, can cause rapid layering of um, sediment all over, and it can make it look like, oh, that just happened uh, over wash off and build up over years, and it didn't. Point me to one single modern flood that has produced many layers of fully lithified rock in a short period of time. This is a claim. It is not backed by any evidence that I am aware of. Provide some of that evidence, please. It also, we should say this, Adam, you know, um, the Bible is not a science book, okay? okay? No, it certainly is not. Which is why I'm often confused at the creationist insistence on attempting to twist scientific fact to fit into their interpretation of the Bible, rather than trying to find an interpretation that better fits with scientific facts. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If your God exists, and created nature, then an unbiased study of nature should not be threatening to you. Which I always think is a good thing, okay? Good. It's a good thing because science changes every couple of years. <sighs> really? Do you really not understand why science changes? Would you prefer science to have remained stagnant in the 1700s so that we would never have figured out how diseases are caused, or that the balancing of the humors is not a great way of treating disease? No harnessing of electricity, no modern comforts? Science changes because science is a study of how the natural world works. The natural world does not change how it works, but our understanding progresses. Every time something changes in science, we move just a little bit closer to having an accurate understanding of the natural world. Would you prefer that doctors in the 1800s, instead of learning about germs and deciding to wash their hands in between patients, had scoffed at this change because they wanted to put their trust in something that never changes? And if the Bible is truth, and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, 
He can't just kind of shift with the latest discovery. Was God the Father the same yesterday, today, and forever? Because in the Old Testament, he was a bit of a meanie, to put it mildly. Not sure I want to put my trust in someone who is known for sending his followers off on genocidal missions. God either knows what truth is or he doesn't. And science is uh, not the enemy of faith, okay? Okay. Um, we should say this right here. The opposite of faith is not science or reason. The opposite of faith is disbelief. I'm tempted to quibble with that, but I suppose I can allow it. The opposite of reason is irrationality, okay? Okay. Um, the scientific method, okay? Okay. And scientific hypothesis is a wonderful thing, but it's not useful when you're trying to prove history. Yeah, human history is not science in the same sense that chemistry is science. There are different criteria for determining the truth and accuracy of historical events than there are for studying the physical history of the Earth using scientific processes. But I feel like you're equating the two and pretending that the study of the physical history of the Earth is similar to the study of human history, which is just not the case. You don't have two rock layers competing with each other, with the winning rock layer writing the history in a way that is biased against the losing rock layer. Would that be Rocky Six? I guess Rocky Balboa was technically Rocky VI, so maybe Rocky VII? Who knows? My point is that we don't have to try and parse out the motivations of the geologic processes when we are examining geology. Same for any of the other sciences. Yes, I know the scientists doing their research do have motivations and biases that need to be eliminated as much as possible, but that is much easier to do with modern human beings that are still alive than it is to do by analyzing scraps of writings from thousands of years ago with human history. Okay. okay. Um, the scientific method is used when you can say, what we're going to do is we're going to make a statement that we believe to be true. Then we're going to collect data and we're going to see uh, what we can see based on um, either experiments or things that we can collect. Then we're going to analyze that data and then we're going to um, make a new statement. We're either going to prove our hypothesis or disprove it. Yeah, that's pretty close to the basics of how the scientific method actually works, but on top of that, before you can publish your results, competing scientists must first look at your work to see if there's something that you missed or did wrong. Then, after publishing it, the rest of the scientific community will examine what you present and try to pick it apart and find problems with it. Please don't leave out the peer review process. It is one of the most important parts of the scientific method. Okay? okay, so let's just talk about a few things that happen, you know, um, that are out there. It sure looks like to get a 20-year-old person, you um, need to have first an egg and a sperm, and you're going to need uh, a zygote, and then you're going to need an embryo, and then you're going to need a fetus, and then you're going to need a baby, and then you're going to need a toddler, and then you're going to need a teenager. Okay? okay. The, the problem is, is that the Bible makes the claim that when God created man, it doesn't necessarily say that's the way he did it. Okay, so formulate your hypothesis. It is possible to create an adult human being from dust. Now lay out what method you would use to test this hypothesis and figure out before doing any testing exactly which outcomes would support your hypothesis and which would falsify it. That way, when you do the actual testing, you can't just ignore data that you don't like if it doesn't support your hypothesis. Now, if you do think of something that would cause your data to support the hypothesis even though it appears to falsify it, that is for the conclusion, where you explain why you think it hasn't been adequately falsified, and suggest further research to account for whatever you thought of after your experiment was started. But you do not deviate from the original plan. Any deviation will raise a bunch of red flags for other scientists that you were trying to get one conclusion over another and will decrease your chances of being able to publish. So God, uh, when he created Adam and Eve, if there is a God, right? When he created Adam and Eve, nobody thinks that he created uh, Adam in the form of a zygote and grew him up and then introduced him that way. He just spoke him into existence. Well, there are people who take the created him from dust bit to refer to abiogenesis, with the story being mostly metaphor or allegory. So don't be quite so hasty in stating categorically that nobody thinks that Adam started life the same way as all other humans started life. Also, keep in mind that you brought up the scientific method immediately before going into this. You are the one proposing the shocking hypothesis that it is possible to get a fully grown human from dust. That goes against the consensus opinion. In order to convince anyone of your hypothesis, you need to have some very robust data backing you up. And no, a story in the Bible is not robust data. So, 
Does that mean that God's deceptive, that he created a man who's 20 years of old with apparent age and therefore he's a liar? Well, you've stated yourself in this video that the earth does indeed appear to be old. Now, the Bible does say that God made Adam from dust, and if you don't leave room for metaphor, allegory, or hyperbolic language, it does seem to imply that he made Adam fully grown, though certainly it never explicitly states this, and there is plenty of room for interpretation. There is lots of stuff that happens in the narratives in between God making man and man actually doing anything, and I can see how it could be easy to interpret this in a way that it is spread out over a long period of time. But sure, you can strip all the nuance from the text if you like and just insist that God made man as a fully formed adult. So from your side, it looks like God made man already mature, and God made the earth appear old when it is not. Why would God make things appear to operate in a way that is not how they actually operate? You can say he has a good reason for it if you want, but deception is deception. He, by your own admission, made the earth look old, yet you want to claim that it's actually young. That makes the appearance of age a deception, and there is no real way around that. That's one of the reasons I get a little discouraged sometimes when people say that um, if we embrace... Um, the, the scientific method that we got to have an old earth because I think they go, well, listen, the stars are, we know, light years away. And so um, if, if God created the stars just a few days before he created man, then those stars didn't have a chance through natural processes to get here if light travels at the speed of light. Right. We can see objects that are 13 billion light years away. So it took the light from those objects 13 billion years to reach Earth, which means that the universe has to be at least 13 billion years old in order for us to be able to see them. Now, sure, God could have made the universe with the light already in progress so that we would be able to see them, but again, that is deceptive. Why make the universe look older than it is? And so if God created a heavens where light was already here from stars that are millions of light years away, then God is a deceptive God. I, I, don't, I don't buy that. And why don't you buy that? In what possible way can this data be interpreted that does not make God look like he is deceiving us? No matter what, he knew that the method he was using to create the universe would make it look 13.7 billion-ish years old. And if you want to believe that he is all-powerful, that means that it would have been trivial for him to have made the universe in a way that makes it abundantly clear that it is only 6,000 years old. But he didn't. He made it look several orders of magnitude older than it actually is, in your opinion. How can you look at that and not think that it's even slightly deceptive? Any more than I think God's deceptive if he creates a 20-year-old man and says, from here on out, you're going to have to be around for 20 years before you're a 20-year-old man. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. so um, the scientific method requires um, repeatable, uh, I guess, observation. It requires that the evidence for something is repeatable, not the something itself. You don't need to produce an actual adult man from dust in order to demonstrate the possibility of producing an actual adult man from dust. But you do need to describe a potential mechanism for this production, and there must be ways of testing aspects of this mechanism. You don't need to do it all at once, it can just be one small piece at a time, but you need to start with something. And the something that you start with has to be able to be duplicated by other scientists. You cannot just make an assertion, declare it a non-repeatable event, and decide that it must be true, but there's no way to test it either way. And we can't go back and repeat a one-time event. Right. No, you cannot repeat a one-time event. However, it is not the event itself that needs to be repeated. It is the examination of the evidence. When the evidence is examined by different scientists working independently, if they all come to the same conclusion, that increases the likelihood that this is the correct conclusion. And then when different fields of science start agreeing with each other independently, that's when you know you're really onto something. So, for instance, if our study of astronomy had told us that the universe is younger than geology tells us the Earth is, then we would know that we have something significantly wrong, as you can't have a planet within a universe that is older than the universe itself. So when geology tells us that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, if astronomy told us that the universe was only 6,000 years old, we would know that we have something wrong. 
But it doesn't. Astronomy fully supports the idea of an old Earth by having a universe that is old enough to have an old Earth existing in it. And these are not single isolated lines of evidence. There are dozens of areas of study from each scientific field that have all given us ages of the Earth and universe that have been independently and repeatedly verified. So no, we can't repeat the Big Bang, but we know with reasonable certainty that the Big Bang did happen, and it happened about 13.7 billion years ago. I want to go back and remind people, Darwinistic theory has never been proven. No, you're right. It's never been proven. It's just made testable predictions that have been tested and found to be accurate. It's just been observed. It just perfectly explains the diversity of life and the relationships between organisms. But yeah, no, it hasn't been proven. Okay, Darwin himself, when he wrote it, famously said, wrote an appendix and said, listen, I got to admit, like just looking at something as simple as the human eye, with its rods, its cones, its cornea, its retina, and all the different components of a human eye, the fact that it could have evolved over what I understand the age of the Earth to be, to be this kind of complex organ, he's just talking about the eye, he says does seem absurd almost to the highest degree. That was not an appendix. That was the introduction to chapter 6 of Origin of the Species, in which he explained how the eye actually did evolve. Darwin was using a rhetorical device that he employed quite frequently, in which he started his argument by agreeing with those who disagree with his conclusion. He grants that they are being perfectly reasonable in their disagreement before going on to explain why he thought they were wrong. And even though the wrong position appears reasonable, he has good reason for thinking them wrong. He would do his best to steel man the opposing position before explaining why it is wrong, rather than strawmanning it like you've done here. Which is actually why it's so easy to quote mine Darwin. He put a lot of time and effort into understanding and explaining the positions that he did not hold. You could learn something from him. Science tests repeatable events. And if you're going to say that there's never been anything outside natural processes that intervenes, I would say the scriptures do rebuke you in your understanding of that. Okay, that's nice. Your book says that supernatural phenomena are real. Okay. Okay. Do you plan on providing any supporting evidence for this position? Because so far, what I've seen from you is that you agree that the Earth and universe appear to be orders of magnitude older than you think they are, you then state that God is not a deceiver, and then Darwin thought the eye couldn't have evolved, therefore God is not a deceiver, and the Earth and universe are young, even though God made them to appear old. Are you planning on tying any of this together anytime soon? Because I'm having a hard time following it. Okay. okay. So I think the Earth looks older than uh, tens of thousands of years. I think probably God's dealings with humans in history is closer to the thousands of years than it is the millions of years, though I don't think I've got to believe it's only 6,000, 10,000. Some people try and do this with the dating of um, the generations, what they call the Toledot in Genesis of uh, the different generations, but that assumes that every generation is listed, okay? okay. Which is why you hear some people say it's six to 10,000 years old. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So the earth appears to be old, and there are ways of interpreting scripture to accommodate an old earth, but the earth is actually young, and God isn't deceptive for having made it look old, because what? The more of this video that I see, the more confused I get. Okay. okay. We're seeing even some of the natural processes that we thought took a long time don't always take that long. Sure. Sometimes we have taken a natural process that would have taken a long time in nature and have been able to duplicate it in a fraction of the time in a lab. Like the formation of diamonds, which realistically we don't actually know how long they take to form, though we do know that the majority of the naturally occurring diamonds on the planet are at least a few hundred million years old. But yeah, we can make artificial diamonds in a lab using methods that are unlikely to occur naturally. Therefore, the Earth is young even though we know the diamonds themselves are old, even if they did form quickly. Fun fact, the only people that actually put a number on how long it takes for diamonds to form naturally are jewelry companies that are trying to convince you that the more expensive natural diamonds are worth the money because the Earth worked for a billion years just to make it. Now, here's why I think you're going to make a big mistake. If you say naturalism or scientism, which is there's never been anything outside of these processes, um, uh, are, is a problem. It's only a problem if you are actually capable of demonstrating the supernatural. Because at the moment, the supernatural is a completely unfalsifiable, non-demonstrable hypothesis that does not adequately explain anything. 
It's also called uniformitarianism, which means as things always have been, they always will be. That is not a very good summary of uniformitarianism. Now, on screen, you have the definition of uniformitarianism from a geological perspective, but it is more broadly applicable than that. It's the idea that the physical laws of nature do not appear to have changed in the past, and there is no reason to think that they will change in the future. Now, at its core, it is a presupposition. It's something that is assumed that cannot be absolutely proven. But if you want to suggest that gravity isn't going to work tomorrow in the same way that it did today, you'd need some pretty strong evidence to support that idea. Or, you know, maybe a demonstration. And I'm just going to read some Bible. Yeah. Okay. Good. And so again, I just want to say, I think probably younger earth makes a whole lot more sense. Creationism, I think, if you look at the data, all right, and again and again, Anthony Flew, a famous atheist who was a naturalist. So you go from, hey, look at the data, it shows a young earth, straight to Anthony Flew, the guy who was a famous atheist turned deist. Okay. Okay. I don't think Anthony Flew would have agreed with your Young Earth creation conclusion. Are you going to bring any evidence to support your Young Earth position, or are you going to continue with your baffling display of cognitive dissonance by agreeing that the Earth does actually look billions of years old, followed by a denial that it's billions of years old, followed by an assertion that a god who makes a Young Earth appear old is not being deceptive? Because so far, that's really all your video has been. Sure, you brought up things like stalactites and stalagmites, but nobody is dating the Earth based on those, so that doesn't really help your point. It is so interesting in the schools why they don't let kids study the two theories of our existence side by side. It could be something to do with the fact that one is indeed a well-supported scientific theory, while the other one is a completely useless, unfalsifiable hypothesis. And actually, if you watch my Evolution Stole My Cookies video, you might remember that I said I do think creationism is falsifiable. At least, when you get into the specifics of which creation they are talking about. So you don't have an unfalsifiable hypothesis, you have a falsified hypothesis. So would you support medical schools teaching that we have to balance the humors and giving that equal time with modern medical ideas? Probably not, because we know at this point that balancing the humors is not a valid medical concept. Well, we know at this point that your specific brand of Young Earth creationism is not a valid geological or biological concept. And that is why it doesn't get taught in schools. Or at least it shouldn't be taught in schools. You do mention later that it legally has to be taught in Texas, which wouldn't surprise me in the least if it were true, but I really hope it's not. That's it for this one. He never does get around to presenting any evidence that the Earth is young, nor does he explain why God could make a young Earth look old without it being a deception of some kind. In fact, he never even got around to destroying the straw man of the scientific position that he set up earlier, with all of the different natural processes looking like they take millions of years. So that's fun. Today's comment of the day comes to us from NTB9, who says, With regard to the cells coming from similar cells, it's worth noting that all the different cells in the human body, skin, muscles, blood, brain, bone, etc., all come from one initial gamete that is formed at conception. Yeah, I didn't even think of that, but yes, the principle of biogenesis states that cells come from other similar cells, which I then took in the direction of macroevolution. But if you think about it, a blood cell is quite different from a brain cell, but they are related and share a common ancestor cell. Yet I don't think anyone would ever think to call them the same kind of cell. So if biogenesis applies here, and the differentiation can get us from gametes to blood and brain cells, why could it not go from algae to a simple sea sponge, and so on into the evolutionary history of life? Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially Mark McManus, who are the caffeine that keeps me chugging through the day. If you'd like to be my mildly addictive stimulant, you can become a patron for as little as $1 per week at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Also thanks to my PayPal heroes today, Candida and Thomas. Links to social media and methods of supporting the channel are in the description, as well as my P.O. Box address. See you next time! Good.